Hello, and welcome to The Law Patrol, proudly presented by Glaze the Legal. On this channel, we take a look at all things legal and lawful, as they happen in Australia and around the world. We review concepts, cases, and just generally shoot the breeze. Whilst we don't give advice, we can answer some questions and hopefully at least point you in the right direction. As we cover everything legal and don't shy away from the hard topics, we may occasionally cover themes or discussions that some may find disturbing or distasteful. So if necessary, make yourself a cup of concrete, put on your big kid pants and pull up a chair. If you have any questions or comments about anything we discuss, please don't hesitate to reach out by email at info at Follow us on Facebook and remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Now, let's get into it. Hello and welcome to today's special edition of the Law Patrol. Our very first deep dive. Today we're going to be looking at Kai the Hatchet-Wielding Hitchhiker. Cable, Caleb McGill, McGillory from Edmund, Edmonton, Alberta is currently serving a sentence of 57 years. Some of you might know him better from his viral interview with KMPH in 2013 after he became known as Kai the Hatchet-Wielding Hitchhiker. McGillory while hitchhiking in 2013, was picked up by Jet Simons McBride. After a disturbing conversation where McBride described himself as Jesus Christ and that he could do anything he wanted to, McBride crashed his vehicle, pinning a person between his vehicle and a parked truck. When bystanders arrived to assist, McBride attempted to physically crush a woman in a twisted version of a bear hug. Sensing that the woman sorry, sensing that the woman's life was in danger and that the 300-pound McBride could snap her neck like a pencil, McGivory jumped into action and repeatedly struck McBride with a hatchet he had on his person. Hailed as a hero, McGivory was interviewed by the local Fox affiliate KMPH with the video going viral and having over 7.8 million views on YouTube as at December 2021. Sadly, in May 2013, McGivory was charged with the death of New, Jer New Jersey attorney Joseph Galfi. At a glance, the investigation, prosecution, and trial of McGivory gave rise to a number of questions as to procedural fairness, impartiality, and allegations of corruption against various officials at various levels. In short, there are allegations that stem from the fact that the brother of the deceased is a high-ranking member of the police force that was investigating the incident, that the deceased was well known to the remaining investigators, including possibly the judge in question, that evidence pertaining to sorry, that evidence pertinent to the case was either ignored, improperly attained, or ignored entirely, and that McGivory was denied certain rights to due process, along with being represented by a public defender who allegedly engaged in conduct that fell short of the expected standards. These are all very serious allegations any number of which could have led to a miscarriage of justice in McGivory's case. Despite this, he was sentenced to 57 years and as of August last year has been unable to successfully appeal his case. His latest matter, lodged in late June 2022, is still ongoing. I'm going to start with the now famous video. I wanted the heroes. Yeah. yeah, can we talk? Do you mind? What do you oh. want to talk about? What happened today? Well, well, went straight out of dog town, skateboarding, surfing it up. Before I say anything else, I want to say no matter what you've done, you deserve respect. Even if you make mistakes, you're lovable. And it doesn't matter your look, skills, or age, or size, or anything, you're worthwhile. It's a fair commentary to put out there. Um, doesn't seem particularly relevant to the topic, but... No one could ever take that away from you. Now... This stuff right here, I was driving and I, well, I was in the passenger side of this car and he comes over on there. He was over by the recycling center. He says, oh, when I was in the Virgin Islands, 30 years old on a business trip, I, 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 uh, I saw this 14 year old. I was like, Jesus. what? He's like, I raped this 14 year old. He starts crying, gives me a big hug. He's like 300 pounds. 300 pound bloke admits to intimately violating a 14 year old and then reaches over and starts crying and gives someone a hug. I too would be disturbed in that situation. Our guy, I'm like, oh, sh you must be fired, man. Like, what's he talking about? I didn't take him seriously at first. Comes driving down this way. He's like, you know what? I come to realize I'm Jesus Christ and I can do anything I want to. And 
Watch this. Bam! And he smashed into this fucking guy right there. Pinned him in between that fucking truck. And so I it, I hop out. I look over. The guy's pinned there. I mean, like, freight train riders know this. Like, if you get pinned between something, do not fucking move that. Yeah, that's actually very good advice. Do not remove whatever. The, the other thing as well is if you have any sort of article embedded within you, um, obviously don't remove it because blood loss will be a bitch and kill you. Um, so I can already sort of see where the issues with McBride are going to go, but um, I suppose we'll wait and see. Shit, I always bleed out. Like, motherfucker, I, I ran in, I grabbed the keys. He fucking sitting there like nothing even happened. And like, fucking like, man, if you started driving that car around again, man, there would have been a hell of a lot of bodies around here. I hop on out, and so I grab the bag, I threw it over by that hole right there, and then fucking buddy gets out, and these two women are trying to help him. He runs up and he grabs one of them, man. Like a guy that big can snap a woman's neck like a pencil stick. So I fucking ran up behind him with a hatchet, smack. 300 pound bloke. Yeah, in all honesty, I would think that this is probably in defense of another. Smash, smash. Smash! Yeah, the, the lady said you right. saved her life. Just gonna bring that Shoot back a little bit. Stick. So I could ran up behind him with the hatchet. Smash! 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 <laughs> yeah, Probably not the, the most the appropriate interview, but life. she was the one who got grabbed by that. F-er. You know what? F-er is cool. That guy ain't. Shit. How, how'd you how'd you get in his car? How how did you? I was hitchhiking. I was well. Good thing I was hitchhiking. Yeah, people say don't hitchhike. Well, this is what happens. Was well, yeah. Well, at least I was here. All right, I'm gonna leave it there because that covers the basis of it. But let's face it, if I keep going, there's a good chance I'll get copyright struck. Um. So yeah. So Kai rose to fame off the basis of that interview. He very much saved the life of a woman. Um. Where are we? Jetnik. Right. So, obviously, there were conflicting articles as to exactly what took place in 2013 and what information has been provided. Um, So, I found various articles. Some of the information is difficult to dig up, in particular because I still don't have access to American court documents. Um, But I'll start with this article from December 18, 2013, from uh, ABC 13 Eyewitness News. Kai was neither hero nor did he cause the crash, witnesses say. Jet McBride's intentions were clear to witnesses who saw him crash into a PNG crew doing work at Marks and McKinley in February. They say his own words gave him away as he rushed towards Rayshon Neely, the man who he just pinned between his own car and a bucket truck for the electric company. He said, I am God, I am Jesus, I was sent here to take all the, insert racial slurs here, to heaven. Not everyone heard the racial slurs aimed at Neely, though. Sitting in a wheelchair at the court hearing weeks later, Neely said he never heard it. McBride apologised to Neely that day, but he said that from the start that the hitchhiker in the car jerked the wheel and forced his car into the PNG crew. Seems like a reasonably obvious attempt to try and deflect responsibility. But, I mean, either, either way even if that was the case, which I'm not saying that it is, the driver of the vehicle still has ultimate responsibility. So um, That's not what the crew members saw, though. Three of them say they saw McBride steadily aiming the car at Neely. His left hand was at 10 o'clock. His right hand would have been about the 2 o'clock position on the steering wheel, says Nelson Pereira. The hitchhiker briefly rose to start him after his own description of the in- incident. The man who called himself Kai said he smashed McBride over the head with a hatchet to free a woman who rushed to help- in to help Neely. The hatchet attack bloodied McBride, but he kept trying to reach Neely. So after three hits to the back of the head with a hatchet, this guy is still going for him. Did this guy get drug tested? Like, I feel like that... Is, that goes beyond your general drug inducement. Like, you, to have an injury to your head like that and still be up and moving about. Mm. 
Starkey and another man eventually got him to the ground, held him down, and cell phone video from the scene shows law enforcement keeping him there. Meanwhile, other P and G and PG and E employees had to corral Kai and his weapon. He was swinging his hatchet at shoulder level at anyone that tried to come near him, Starkey said. Doesn't sound particularly good. Kai won't appear in court for McBride's trial because he's jailed the murder charges of his own in New Jersey. The testimony from an earlier hearing will be read to the jury earlier this uh, later this week. Uh, that's not great because if he's unable to provide eyewitness testament, they're relying on documents which have little to no context. So what's this? So this is another ABC channel, ABC 30. Jet McBride found not guilty of attempted murder. Damn. Fresno, California. After a month-long trial, it took the jury just a few hours to reach a verdict in the case of Jet McBride. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Jet Simmons McBride, not guilty of Penal Code Section 664-187, Subdivision A, attempted murder as to count one, the juror said. McBride was charged with attempting murder for running his car into PG&E worker Rayshawn Neely on February 1 of 2013. Neely's leg was mangled when McBride's car pinned him to his truck. Another worker was less seriously hurt. The incident gained national attention because McBride's passenger, Caleb McGilvery, also known as Kai the Hitchhiker, who attacked McBride with a hatchet after McBride got out of his car and appeared to be attacking the injured man and other bystanders. Because he's in jail facing charges in New Jersey, McGilvery was not allowed to come back to Fresno to testify. The jury had to rely on the reading of his crazy statements. That's shit ass. Um... McBride's attorney, Scott Bailey, said that not having the key witness in the courtroom was a factor in the trial. No shit, you think? I won't say whether it hurt or helped. It affected everything. The jury cleared McBride of attempted murder, but they did find him guilty of assault with a deadly weapon on both Neely and the other worker and found him guilty of enhancements. Bailey hoped for an acquittal on all charges. Seriously? That's some pretty fucking wishful thinking, dude. Especially when you've got multiple witnesses as to what happened. I think there's a mix of emotions for all of us. I certainly think that the moment the not guilty on count one was read, there was relief. It was followed shortly by a guilty reading on counts two and three, so there's a different feeling on those charges. Well, boo! Assault with a deadly weapon could mean four years in prison on each count. The enhancements for using a car as a weapon and causing injury could add more. It depends on the judge, but... Bailey estimates the maximum he could face is nine years, but the trial isn't over. The judge has to come back. To the, sorry, the jury has to come back to decide if McBride was insane at the time of the incident. If they decide he was, he could be sentenced to a mental hospital, not prison. Um, and I do believe I can't. I can't refind it, but I did find an article. Oh, I should mention this is the second time that I'm trying to actually do this video. I did it yesterday as well. Um, I spent a whole hour and a half on it. Forgot to hit the fucking record button. Got right to the end and went, okay, time to end the broadcast. Click the button. Here, would you like... Uh, but The thing pops up. Would you like to commence recording? Fuck! <laughs> um, but I, the point is, I did find another news article that basically said that Jet McBride was determined to be insane at the time, so he was not um, incarcerated, but rather spent time in a mental institution. Now, the most recent thing was in um, Kai filed some documents for... He's lodged a number of cases against various individuals, against the Union County, against um, the estate of the deceased, the brother, the police, um, who's the police officer, alleging that the, um, the investigation was improper, um, various other bits and pieces. Having read over the documents, I do think Kai's biggest problem is that he's self-represented. A lot of the doc from from the wording of the judgment that the judges, sorry, from the wording of the opinions that the judges made in various things. And I should note, in almost every case, the same judge has been involved, whether whether she's been assisted by she or he. Sorry, it does say Alex. It could be either. Um, oh wait, no. What was it? It was. What was it? I was sure it was a woman. Uh, no, I can't find it. Bloody hell. Um, oh. Okay, so that's Judge Wolfson, so that's the new one. 
No, it was, sorry. I, I, it was not Alex. It was Ar Ar Arlio. Madeline Cox Arlio. So it is Judge Judge Arlio. Um, and she she's handled a few of the different cases that he's been, that he's been involved in and that he's lodged. Um, so I am curious as to whether or not there's an opportunity to apply to have her recused, given that there have been um, one or two decisions there that may impact. But the fact that he's been before her so many times and she's ruled against him pretty much every single time, um, I think, yeah. I mean, you can't always just pick and choose which judge you get, but I think it's getting up there with the um, potential conflict. Um, but yeah, so because a lot of the a lot of the opinions that she gave came down to missing interpretations of the law as to who was a who was the appropriate people to be sued, who was uh, sorry, what the contents of the documents were, whether or not things were properly pled, that sort of thing. So it's not to say that Kai didn't have appropriate grounds; it's that they weren't properly enunciated to the court, and so therefore they had to dismiss and not view them. Um, so, um, but look, the most recent one appealing against his murder conviction, um, where was it? Oh, I'll just read this news article. It makes it simple. I'm trying to avoid instances from the Washington Post and various other places because, frankly, I don't want to give them any airtime after how they've treated myself and various people in LawTube. So I'm having to use secondhand resources from other... Um, pretty much wherever I can get it. But again, not being able to have the original court documents or the fact that the trial was not televised um, from the 2019 era. And I should point out, he spent a hell of a long time behind bars before this ever got to trial. I mean, he was arrested in 2013. I think the original, um, there were bits and pieces that happened throughout the years, but he spent four years in remand before it actually got to any sort of trial. Um, so, yeah, not hugely appropriate in my books. Um... All right, so that's the one from f from 6th of May. Where's the one from? So that's August 2000 and... That's, again, a different one. All right, so that's the 2021 one in the Superior Court of New Jersey Appellate Division. It's the original opinion of the New Jersey District Court. That's May this year. Where on earth is the rest of the court documents? I know I had them. Okay, that's fine. Well, we'll cover... We'll start by covering um, McGivory versus Union County, uh, which was... The opinion was given on the 30th of April, 2020, but I'll read through this article first. I did have a better version of that. I'm going to have to use case mine because I can't find the other one. Um, viral internet star Kai the Hitchhiker loses appeal in his New Jersey murder conviction. A panel of New Jersey appeals judges has upheld the murder conviction of Canadian man known as Kai the Hitchhiker for the colourful and viral news interview he gave in early 2013 that has since racked up almost 8 million views on YouTube. Caleb Kai McGivory, 32, was convicted in April 2019 open that up, sorry, um, of killing Joseph Galfi, a 74-year-old attorney. Do you do diligence, people? Even the court documents say that he was 73. Attorney who was found beaten to death in his Clark home in May 2013. Galfi had befriended the newfound internet sensation in New York Times Square and drove him to New Jersey. McGilvery 
has maintained he acted in self-defense when their brief time together turned violent when Gelfi sexually assaulted him as he slept. A month after a jury convicted the Alberta, Canada native, a Union County judge sentenced him to 57 years in state prison. The next day, he posted on his legal defense Facebook page that he was looking for a real lawyer for an appeal, um, which comes back to the public defender comments, but I'll cover that in a minute. Um, that he was confident he would overturn his conviction and that he'd been compiling instances of misconduct, abuse of discretion, and inf ineffectiveness of defense counsel. Just to clarify, every single person, any time they appear before any court, is entitled to legitimate representation, irrespective of what you may think they have or have not done. Every single person is entitled to due process, procedural fairness, and an appropriate defense. In the official appeal, a new lawyer and McGivray himself filed legal briefs arguing 15 total points. Okay, so in that at that point when he was um, so for the so why did why oh maybe you got a lawyer after the 2021. Okay. Um, I'm still reading through various bits and pieces of court documents, but I know that in the 2021 he appeared pro se, so I think that was a big part of his problem. That's A15918. So that's, yep, so that's the one that I've already got. Okay. Um, the two appellate judges found little merit with any of the arguments, pushing them back on in a 36-page decision. The responses were blunt at times, like after pinpoint examination of trial testimony, the, appellant judge, the appeals judges wrote in one section, the record does not suggest a miscarriage of justice occurred. The jury assessed the defendant's testimony and proffered defences and rejected them. This is some pretty harsh language from whoever wrote this actual article. I mean, you expect media bias, but still. McGivory's trial was contentious, featured numerous outbursts by McGivory and the judge, Robert Kirsch, having to quell several arguments among the defendant and lawyers. During his sentencing, McGivory once interrupted Kirsch with, are you fucking kidding me? And the judge reminded him of reminded him several, time, several times to keep your mouth shut. McGivory's appeal arguments were unusual at times too. For example, in one appeal, he argued that he was treated disrespectfully on several occasions and it caused him harm at trial. Yeah, how is that unusual? The court showing bias, specifically if one of the judges or something shows bias towards him in front of the jury, that's a major issue. I mean, I as I said... Court wasn't tele televised. I've only got bits and pieces. I would need to read the entire transcript. But based on what information I do have, some of these allegations may be substantive. Occasionally, the record establishes the judge became frustrated with the proceedings and with defendant's conduct in the courtroom. These instances were rare, did not affect the legal rulings, and could not have prejudiced the jury's verdict. Right. And in the briefs McGivory wrote himself, he argued he should have been permitted to call the prosecutor and judge to the stand as witnesses. Yeah, no, that doesn't work. They've got litigation immunity as prosecutors and judge. Um, they're considered to be doing their job, so they're immune from... Um, you also can't sue them for doing their job either. And that Kirsch once denied seeing sheriff's officers laughing at his recorded police statement to police when it was played to the jury. These requests were procedurally improper and have no foundation in the record, the judges wrote. McGivory is currently serving his sentence at New Jersey State Prison in Trenton and has a release date of October Again, same news source, but at the same time, uh, Kyla Hitchhiker found guilty of beating 73-year-old NJ man to death. So in their own in their own news article, a year, um, however long later, they've managed to get the, the, the deceased's age wrong. I do find that hilarious because they could have just looked back at their own work. 
Um, Kai the Hitchhiker, who rose to viral internet fame after a bizarre television interview in 2013, again, using unnecessarily inflammatory language, but I digress, was convicted Wednesday in the beating death of a prominent 73-year-old New Jersey lawyer in his Union County home six years ago. Yeah, so the trial, it took six years for the trial to even get to the original stage. The jury found Caleb Kai McGivory, 30, guilty of the first... First degree murder a day after they begin began deliberating the testimony in the three week trial. Interesting. See, I thought that they took two days, but hmm. he faces up to life in prison and was and will be sentenced on June thirteen. McGilvery is accused was accused of killing Joseph Galfi on May 13, thousand thirteen, after the encounter turned violent. The a Canada native claimed he acted in self-defense after waking up to Gelfie allegedly sexually assaulting him. This was brutal, vicious, senseless, and we are pleased that the interests of justice have been served, said acting Union County Prosecutor Michael Monaghan. We sincerely thank the jury for their service and hope that today's verdict brings some, some measure of solace to Mr. Gelfie's family, friends, and loved ones. Mm -hmm. The contentious trial at the Union County Courthouse nearly ended in McGilvery being thrown out of the courtroom after he had an outburst following his lawyer's closing arguments. Yeah, no, you never want to do that. Even if you're upset with things, you don't make outbursts, particularly during your own lawyer's arguments. Um, but no, if, the, if there's issues, you raise them on paper um, after the fact. You don't, you don't disrupt the court. That is going to do nothing for you to give you favours or anything like that. John Seto, McGilvery's defense attorney, cast his client as a young man with a home-free lifestyle who appears to, who has always looked for the best in people. Seto argued police failed to properly investigate the killing and did not pursue evidence that would have proved the sexual misconduct, sorry, sexual assault occurred. McGilvery became an internet, so yeah, okay, talking about the art, uh, about his... Uh, McGilvery testified at the trial, though it became though it became combative when he was cross-examined by Assistant Prosecutor Scott Peterson. The two often raised their voices and talked over each other, forcing Judge Robert Kirsch to call order to the courtroom and remind McGilvery several times not to speak out of turn or add irrelevant information. McGilvery pushed back, arguing he was treated worse than the other witnesses and his Sixth Amendment right was being infringed. Assistant Prosecutors Gillian Reyes and Peterson said... Galfrey's brutal injuries, three skull fractures, four broken ribs, and several contusions showed this was far from self-defense and not even funny. At what point was anyone saying that it was funny? One of the prosecution's star witnesses, Janaid Sheikh of the Division of the County Medical Ex Examiner, testified Galfrey sustained serious blunt force injuries to the face, neck, chance face, neck, chest, and arms, which he said were inconsistent with self-defense. Okay. Prosecution also pointed to inconsistencies between McGivory's original statement when he was arrested in 2013 and his testimony. After the chance meeting in Times Square, Galfi invited McGivory to come sleep at his house, and the hitchhiker took the offer. He testified that when he woke up on May 12th, 2013, he had bodily fluids on his face that tasted salty. Ooh. According to testimony at the trial, Galfi drove McGilvery to the railway train station on May 12th, and the hitchhiker, hitchhiker took the train to Asbury to meet with a friend. Needing a place to stay again, he stayed in the guest room of Galfrey's Clark home. Galfrey poured McGilvery a beer, and the 30-year-old said he blacked out after that. When he woke up, his pants were down, and Galfrey was grinding and humping him. McGilvery testified. McGilvery said he hit the lawyer and ran away. Galfrey was found dead in his bedroom, face down in his underwear and socks, during a wellness check on May 13, 2013. He was 73. And what, what, why was there a necessity for a wellness check? Unless he had, did he have some sort of mental issues? Was it, was, were people concerned that he was unable to look after himself? That's got all sorts of connotations that... At that point, prosecutors said McGilvery fled to Philadelphia, cut his hair, cha and changed his clothes. 
Yes, because God forbid someone with long hair would want to get a haircut if they're traveling on the road. He was arrested at a Greyhound bus stop in the city on May 16 and has been awaiting trial in Union County Jail ever since and continued to do so for, what, six years in total? Hmm. All right. I'll use the case mine one, but I want to actually try and see if I can find better ones from now on. Oh, I can close that. Okay. Oh, hang on. PDF. Does that let me download? No, page page. Okay. All right. McGivory v. Union, Union County, United States District Court, District of... Nice. Uh, District of New Jersey. Okay. Alio, United, St United States District Judge. As I said, Alio has uh, Alio, Alio wound up um, covering a number of his cases. So, interested. I did read through this one yesterday, so I have developed some extra thoughts. Um, but yeah, we'll read through it and hopefully get somewhere. Uh, this matter has been opened by the court open to the court by plaintiff Caleb McGilvery's complaint asserting violations of his civil rights in connection with the investigation and prosecution of pla the plaintiff for the murder of Joseph Galfrey Jr. in May 2013. Presently before the court are four separate motions to dismiss the plaintiff's complaint pursuant to the federal um, civil procedure rules brought by the Clark Police Department, Clark Police Chief Pedro Matas, Joseph Siran, Edward Souter, Union County Jr. Um, New Jersey, and the Union County Sheriff's Office. Bunch of names, bunch of names. For the reasons explained in the, mem in the mem memorandum opinion, the court will grant the motions to dismiss all against the moving defendants, as to all moving defendants. Um, factual background. Now, thankfully, this does cover um, various bits and pieces as to the background. So it did give me sort of more of a general overview as to what is claimed to have happened in Gulfrey's um, bedroom. Um, in the complaint, the plaintiff generally asserts that the city, county and state defendants were involved in the investigation of the deceased's death and were aware that the plaintiff claimed he had been sexually assaulted and drugged by the deceased. According to the complaint, the plaintiff was arrested in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on May 16, 2013 by members of the Philadelphia Police Department and members of the Union County Prosecutor's Office, who were promptly notified. Oh, sorry, and members of the Prosecutor's Office were notified. Assistant Union County Prosecutor Peterson, who reports to Prosecutor Park, along with the University County Prosecu uh, Union County Prosecutor's Office, Detectives Delacqua, Henderson, Ho, and Vendas responded in person to the P Philadelphia Police Department. Detectives Vendas and Ho interviewed the plaintiff at the Philadelphia Police Department. The plaintiff reported to him th that he had been sexually assaulted and drugged by Galfi. According to the complaint, neither detective informed the plaintiff of his rights to a rape care advocate or a forensic medical examination, and a sexual assault, assault response team was not activated. A sexual assault forensic evidence collection kit and a toxicology analysis were not performed on the plaintiff. Whilst arguably, arguably three days later, those tests may not have yielded any results, as soon as he mentioned that, they should have still conducted those tests, in my opinion. Um, I mean, yes, I, I don't specifically know how long say, rohypnol or other drugs that may or may not have been used in the instance stay in your system, but I would expect that at the very least they should have been carried out as a matter of course. So, According to the plaintiff, these defendants fail to follow the standards set by the Attorney General of the State of New Jersey and the Attorney General of the State of Pennsylvania for victims of sexual assault. These defendants also did not inform the plaintiff of his rights to immediate medical attention or the benefit of evidence collection. 
things that he still should have been informed of, absolutely. Plaintiff ex the plaintiff has explained that the evidence of sexual assault is material to his claim of self-defense and would exonerate him from criminal liability in con connection with the death of Galfi. Yes and no. Yes, the evidence of the sexual assault taking place would be extraordinarily helpful to his case, but even in that instance, you've still got to satisfy whether or not the reasonable force of self-defense, whether or not the force that he used to defend himself against that instance was reasonable in the circumstances. I mean, to be fair, yes, he had been drugged, but we are still talking about a 73-year-old man. Um, so theoretically, a younger gentleman is going to be, be able to overpower him, provided he's not armed and... It's difficult because not only would you still need... So there's varying levels. You'd need to be able to prove that you were drugged, so therefore you were incapacitated. In addition to that, you would need to prove that the use of force was reasonable and proportionate to the offence that was being committed against you, or at least that's my understanding of it here anyway. Um, because it's going to be more harmful to his case if, you, if he was fully cognizant and he's used that much force against an elderly gentleman. So, yes, it plays into it. I wouldn't necessarily say that it would give a full defense. Um, but certainly, I would think reduction of the sentence, absolutely, would be my, in, in my honest opinion. Um, the plaintiff next asserts that the defendant, Panina, Padina is not a registered nurse or physician and was contacted by the UCPO to prepare an expert report and to diagnose the plaintiff's physical and mental state in the report. According to the plaintiff, the defendant did not provide care meeting the standards set by the American College of Emergency Physicians for the evaluation and management of SA or SA patients. The plaintiff further alleges that a sexual assault forensic evidence collection kit and toxicology analysis was performed on the deceased Galfi on May 14 by a licensed physician, and that this analysis showed the plaintiff did not sexually assault Galfi. The analysis also showed evidence that Galfi's semen and traces of un showed evidence of his semen and traces of unidentified blood. Okay. The plaintiff asserts that the examination performed on Galfi followed standard procedures for sexual assault victims, but this proce procedure was not followed for the plaintiff. Yeah, okay. The plaintiff next asserts that the investigators falsely asserted to the media that the plaintiff had a romp with Galfi. Assistant Prosecutor Peterson also told the grand jury that the rape kit performed on Galfi proved the plaintiff had not been raped that the plaintiff showed no signs of being drugged after the incident, contradicted the evidence, including witness reports. How do you know he showed no signs? If he specifically said that he has been drugged and potentially sexually assaulted, that's good. That, that has all sorts of things that should trigger off, irrespective of whether or not you think someone... I mean, okay, fine. How about this officer? You pull someone over that's been, that, um, that's been speeding or whatnot, you talk to them, they seem fine. They then drive off and smash into another car carrying a family and kill everybody involved. Afterwards, it turns out toxicology shows that the guy was completely drunk. Given that you would have still had plenty of cause to give him a breathalyzer test, why would you not have taken the same procedure here in this instance and run the, done the drug analysis so that the information could be conclusive? Okay, where was I? Um, the plaintiff next asserts the investigators falsely asserted to the media that the plaintiff had a romp with Galfi. Above at 44, Assistant Prosecutor Peterson also told the grand jury that the rape kit performed on Galfi proved that the plaintiff had not been raped and the plaintiff showed no signs of being drugged after the incident, contradicting the evidence, including witness reports. Detective Ho testified to the grand jury that beer bottles found in Gal Galfi's garage were swabbed for analysis when, in fact, Detective Suda fumigated and cleaned the bottles and all other collected glasses and did not perform any DNA drug analysis. It's a hell of an accusation. 
Prosecutor Peterson also intentionally misled the grand jury by stating that no semen was found, despite the fact that Galfi's own semen was found. Yeah, that's that's quite a misstep there. Doesn't lend uh, very much doesn't aid to their credibility. Detective Ho also testified to the grand jury that no semen was found in the bedroom where Galfi was discovered, and that the plaintiff where the plaintiff claims sexual assault occurred. The plaintiff asserts that Galfi's home was searched for evidence by Detective Henderson and Sheriff Gardner on May 15, 2013, and they photographed and collected evidence from the home but failed to collect samples of stains on the carpet in the master bedroom, take the glasses out of the dishwasher, or collect all the pill bottles in the home so that those items could be analysed. Uh, plaintiff also asserts that Defec Detective Ho also falsely testified before the grand jury that all pill bottles in the home were collected. Okay, so the... So there's some significant gaps between testimony and what may or may not have actually happened. The plaintiff also asserts that Padina is engaged in the unauthorized practice of medicine or psychiatry by providing expert testimony in criminal cases without a license to practice medicine or psychiatry. The plaintiff further asserts that defendants enabled Padina's unauthorized practice of medicine or psychiatry and denied the plaintiff due process and equal protection of the law. The plaintiff asserts the defendants denied the plaintiff due process and equal protection under law by failing to follow the Attorney General standards. Finally, the plaintiff asserts that the investigation of Galfi's death and the plaintiff's indictment and prosecution for Galfi's murder were conducted in bad faith in violation of the plaintiff's right to due process and equal protection, and that the loss, destruction, and suppression of evidence has denied the plaintiff the ability to obtain a fair trial. Procedural history... The plaintiff's complaint was docketed on December 23rd, 2015. Along with claims for damages and other forms of equitable relief, the plaintiff's complaint seeks to enjoin his pending state criminal prosecution. The state defendants moved to dismiss the claims for injunctive relief pursuant to Younger and Harris and sought dismissal of the remaining claims for damages. Okay, that's going to be difficult because he's basically saying that he's bringing claims for damages against public officials for activities engaged in their official capacities, which is generally prohibited. In the alternative, the state defendants asked the court to stay the matter pending the outcome of the plaintiff's criminal proceedings. The plaintiff opposed the motion. On November 16, 2016, the court granted the state defendant's motion to dismiss the plaintiff's claims for injunctive relief, seeking to enjoin his criminal pr prosecution pursuant to Younger. The court also granted the defendant's motion to stay the plaintiff's remaining damages claims pending the outcome of his state court criminal proceedings. On 11 July 2019, the plaintiff submitted a letter request to reopen this matter. Attached to his letter request was a copy of the judgment of conviction showing he was convicted of the first degree murder of Joseph Galfi on April 24th, 2019, following a jury trial. The plaintiff was sentenced on 30th of May to 57 years in prison, subject to the No Early Release Act. The judgment of conviction dated May 30th, 2019. I'll oh, see the judgment, okay. On 20th of June, 2019, the plaintiff filed a notice to appeal with the New Jersey Appellate Division. His appeal is currently pending. The court reopened this matter on the 22nd of July, 2019, and the instant motions to dismiss followed. The state defendants moved to dismiss the plaintiff's complaint pursuant to the federal civil procedure rules for lack of subject matter jurisdiction and assert they are entitled to sovereign immunity under the 11th Amendment. The government official can't be sued in their um, capacity for um, uh, basically doing their job as government officials. It's more or less litigation privilege for the judge and the um, prosecutor. Whether or not that extends to the police, I'll be interested to see. This motion may properly be considered a motion to dismiss for lack of subject matter because the 11th Amendment is a jurisdictional bar which deprives the federal courts of subject matter jurisdiction. Yeah, so the, it's items that would necessarily needed to have been raised in the state courts. In resolving a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim, the court... Courts accept all factual allegations are true as true, construe the complaint in the light most favourable to the plaintiff and determine whether under any reasonable reading of the complaint, the plaintiff may be entitled to relief. So they're required to read the complaint down, irrespective of how it's been drafted, to 
basically make it as plausible as possible to see whether or not there's even a scintilla of a case to be answered. Interesting. Okay. I should clarify, this is all based on US law. I would love to discuss this matter with some of the US law tubers. Um, I can only clarify based on my own knowledge and my own readings of things. Um, so I do apologize if I, if I get anything wrong here or if there's any arguments back and forth or anything like that. Um, I can only go off what knowledge I have, and I am by far not an expert on um, US law, let alone the laws of New Jersey or the federal courts. So I can, I can only look at it from a legal, legal analysis standpoint and make my own comments on it. As a pro se litigant, so he appeared on his own behalf, the plaintiff is entitled to liberal construction of his complaint, yes, to survive dismissal under the rule, a complaint must contain sufficient factual matter, except that it is true to state the claim of the relief is plausible on its face. Yes. A claim has facial plausibility when the plaintiff pleads factual content that allows the court to draw reasonable inferences that defendant is liable for the misconduct, misconduct alleged. Excuse me. The court has already dismissed the plaintiff's claims for injunctive relief seeking to enjoin his prosecution and now liberally construes his remaining claims for relief, which arise under Section 1983. Section 1983 provides a civil remedy for the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and laws. Okay, so we're really going back to procedural fairness and the other rights under the Bill of Rights. Well, of course we are. This is, uh, this is the federal court, so... Uh, to state a claim under Section 1983, a plaintiff must demonstrate that some person has been derived has deprived him of a federal right, and that the person who has derived him of that deprived him of that right acted under the colour of the state or territorial law. Eleventh mm -hmm. Amendment immunity and personhood requirement. From the outset, the Eleventh Amendment incorporates a general principle of sovereign immunity, which bars citizens from bringing suits for damages against any state in federal court. <clears throat> Yeah, so again, it's, it, theoretically, it would need to be raised in the state court. In general, the 11th Amendment immunity extends to state agencies and state officials in their official capacities, and in, doubt, in doubtful cases, the court analyzes several factors to determine whether an entity is an agent of the state, i.e. whether the state is the real party in the interest. Relatedly, a state and its department are not considered persons amenable to suit under 1983. Also barred are Section 1983 suits for damages against governmental entities that are also considered arms of the state for the 11th Amendment purposes, which are no different than a state than a suit against the state itself. I understand why the 11th Amendment's there. I understand how it's worded. I can also understand how anyone that is unfamiliar with um, courts and jurisdiction would see this as a cop out. So, because anyone reading this particular opinion at face value would be looking at it, looking at it and going, "Okay, so basically what you're saying is that executive branch officials can't be sued in the court when acting in their own public, uh, when acting in a public um, position, which isn't strictly the case. It's more just they can't be sued in the public in the, for their public position in federal court." Because they're state officials. Uh, state officials sued in their official capacities are likewise not persons subject to the damages suit under 1983. On the other hand, a state official sued in his, per his or her personal capacity is a person amenable to the suit under 1983 and does not enjoy the 11th Amendment protection, in accordance with Haffer and Mello. The Third Circuit has held that when a county prosecutor's office is performing its core functions of investigating and prosecuting crime, it acts as an arm of the state. Yeah, okay, so the prosecution office is going to be exempt. Because the plaintiff has sued the Union County Prosecution's Office in connection with his prosecution for Galfie's death, the court finds that it was acting as an arm of the state. Yeah. For those reasons, the court will grant with prejudice the motion to dismiss. Yeah, so he's not going to be able to bring anything against the prosecutor's office unless he has serious evidence to um, avoid that. To the extent the plaintiff is suing the state defendants Delacqua, Henderson, Ho, Hoffman, Park, Peterson, Vendus, Roder, and Walker, or Walker, in his or her official capacity for damages, these claims are likewise dismissed with prejudice. Municipal entities and the mono liability. Plaintiff has also sued the Clark Police Department and Union, Ca Union County Sheriff's Offices. Oh, excuse me. In New Jersey, a municipal 
police department is not a separate legal entity from the governing municipality. That's interesting. Okay. Um, here, Victoria Police is very much a separate entity. I think it's even actually a separate company that governs it, which is one of the issues that, you know, sovereign citizens or, um, you know, anti-police people here in Victoria have because they consider it to be a private corporation when, in fact, it's a statutory body established by legislation. Um, but it's still considered separate from the government for the purposes of suing, being sued, acting in their... Um, legal capacity, that sort of thing. So it's interesting to see that in this case, the police department basically comes under, under the um, municipality government. So the case law uniformly holds that the property defendant is the municipality itself, not the police department. Yeah, okay. So because he's brought it against the officers, this is going to be dismissed too. The case law uniformly holds... Yep. Um, we further agree with the district court that the police department was not a proper party to this action, although local governments may constitute persons against whom a suit may be lodged under 1983. A city police department is a governmental subunit that is not distinct from the municipality. The court will therefore grant the motion to dismiss with prejudice as to the Clark Police Department and the Union County Sheriff's Office as these entities are not property defendants. Yep. The court next considers whether the plaintiff states a Monell claim against the city of Clark or the county of Union. Municipalities and other local governments can be sued directly under 1983 for monetary declaratory, declaratory or injunctive relief where the deprivation, deprivation resulted from an official policy or custom. Although the municipality may be liable under 1983, it cannot be held liable on a theory of respondeat superior. To the extent that plaintiff asserts, I just want to double check that respondent superior. Respondeat superior. Legal doctrine most commonly in tort that holds an employer or principal legally responsible for the wrong flex. Yeah, okay. We have different wording for that here in Australia. So respondeat superior, we basically call vicarious liability. So an employer is um, responsible for the actions taken by its employee, provided that those actions were um, undertaken in the course of their employment or is it within the bounds of the agency. To the extent that the plaintiff asserts violations of his constitutional rights by the city of Clark or the county of Union, he fails to plead any facts showing that any alleged deprivation of his constitutional rights resulted from a policy or custom of either of these municipalities. Okay. As such, the court grants the motion to dismiss as to the City of Clark and the County of Union and dismiss these entities without prejudice. So that basically comes down to an issue with the way that the pleadings were drafted. So whether that is... I'm unsure whether or not Kai drafted the, these particular pleadings himself or if he actually had the assistance from the solicitor, this, the lawyer this time around. Um, but given that it was without prejudice, if he's able to reword the complaint and bring it more into line with what's required by the court, he could potentially reopen that one. Uh, the personal involvement requirement. It is axiomatic that a defendant in a civil rights action must have personal involvement in the alleged wrongs. Yeah. Liability cannot be predicated solely on the operation of respondent, respondeat superior. Okay. Plaint okay, so... A plaintiff must plead that the government official defendant, though the, through the official's own individual actions, has violated the Constitution. Here, the court will grant the motion to dismiss without prejudice as to, the, as to Clark Police Chief Pedro Matastia. Okay. All right, so they're basically saying that they're setting it aside against the individual police officers. Um, because in a civil rights action, they must have personal, in, personal involvement. Okay, well, that's that, look, that's not great, but at the same time, it, yes, it removes a bunch of defendants, but that's basically just the way that the law is actually structured. So that's not really prejudicial against his case. It's just that his claims that he was bringing was against the wrong person. Remaining section 1983 claims and defendants. The court next addresses the plaintiff's substantive claim for relief against the remaining moving defendants sued in their personal capacities. The exact contours of the plaintiff's 1983 claims are unclear, but the court construes the complaint liberally. Again, that comes down to the drafting of the complaint documents. So, again, I would suggest having it reviewed. Um, I'll be very surprised if any more of these allegations or motions are dismissed um, 
with prejudice then, because it does sound like the judge was trying to be reasonably, like they weren't, from the sounds of it, they weren't trying to get overturned on the appeal because they've left avenues for it to be reviewed. So. The courts construes the plaintiff to allege that his substantive due process rights were violated by the defendant's negligent or reckless investigation into Galfi's death. According to the plaintiff, prosecution prosecutor Peterson and detectives Delacqua, Henderson, Ho, and Vendas failed to investigate the plaintiff's allegations and collect the very evidence that would have established that the plaintiff acted in self-defense. Again, that's I can understand that. Um, from my viewing of the videos and whatnot, I understand that there was a quite a large, uh, there was quite a substantial amount of urine on the carpet that supposedly could have been taken and tested for drugs and whatnot. Um, I do think it's negligent that they didn't have that tested. I mean, if they didn't go there until a few days after, there's always the chance that the urine itself had dried or whatever. But presumably, there would still be certain tests that could be undertaken. I wouldn't really know, unfortunately. That's not really my area. But if it's at all possible, I would expect them to have still undertaken those tests. Uh, Detective Henderson and Sheriff Gardner likewise failed to collect evidence from Gulfie's home that would have supported the plaintiff's defense that he was drugged and sexually assaulted. A claim for negligent investigation is not recognizable in a civil rights action. Well, yeah, because it's not... If anything, it would, it would be a tort as opposed to a civil right being infringed. Inf uh, I was going for infringed and then impugned, and I managed to conflate the words. It seemed like I've got some thoughts stuck in my throat, and it's just not, it's just sitting right there. Um, as explained by the Third Circuit, negligence by public officials is not actionable as a due, due, pro, a due process dep deprivation of a civil right. See Wilson and Russo. As a general matter, negligence does not trigger a constitutional violation. Assuming the conduct alleged amounts to recklessness, the Third Circuit in Johnson and Logan expressed significant doubts about whether there is an independent substantive due process right to be free from a reckless investigation. So they're actually saying that someone being reckless in, uh, in conducting an investigation against you does not infringe your right to a due process. Because presumably there would be other causes of action. Okay. Interesting. Likewise, in Genesis v. Cox, the circuit court expressed doubts as to the viability of such a claim. Okay. Um, for example, so Newton and New City and New South of New York, there is no constitutional right to an adequate investigation. You can't force someone to do their job, apparently. Again, interesting. Um, the Third Circuit further stated that such a claim, if cognizable, could only arise under the Fourth Amendment if the complaint is that of a form of legal process resulting from pre-trial detention unsupported by probable cause, then the right allegedly of fringe lies with the Fourth Amendment. Okay. A plaintiff cannot state a due process claim by com combining what are essentially claims for false arrest under the Fourth Amendment and state law malicious prosecution into a sort of hybrid substantive claim process under the Fourteenth Amendment. Even if the plaintiff could proceed on a reckless investigation claim under the Fourth Amendment, if the plaintiff were to succeed on his claim that the evidence the def defendants recklessly failed to obtain would exonerate him and establish the fact that he acted in self-defense, that determination would necessarily impugn the validity of his conviction for Galfie's murder. Yeah, so because he's bringing it in a civil as opposed to a criminal appeal. Okay. For this reason, the plaintiff's claim of reckless investigation, to the extent such a claim is cognizable, is barred by the favourable termination rule in Heck and Humphrey. In Heck, the Supreme Court held that a prisoner cannot use 1983 to obtain damages where success would necessarily imply the unlawfulness of a not previously invalidated conviction or sentence. So basically, if you've been found guilty of a crime, irrespective of whether or not you're intending to appeal it, you can't sue for damages if 
the result of a civil case, which has a lesser burden, would impugn the validity of your conviction. I understand the basis and the gravitas of that. I still think it's shit. Um, because each case is supposed to be held on its merits. Because the plaintiff has not shown his conviction has been set aside, he cannot bring a claim for reckless investigation at this time. The claim is therefore dismissed without prejudice until such time as a plaintiff sets aside his conviction. The state defendants also construe the, construe the plaintiff's complaint to assert a more familiar Fourth Amendment claim for malicious prosecution to prove malicious com Malicious prosecution under 1983, a plaintiff must show, one, that the defendant initiated a criminal proceeding. Yep. Two, the criminal proceedings ended in the plaintiff's favour. Well, they didn't. He was convicted. The proceeding was initiated without probable cause. Mm -hmm. And four, the defendants acted maliciously or for the purpose other than bringing the plaintiff to justice. You could potentially get there based on the sort of old boys club sort of scenario that's been going on. Oh, excuse me. Um, and five, the plaintiff suffered deprivation of liberty consistent with the concept of seizure as a consequence of the legal proceeding. Because the plaintiff is unable to establish favourable termination, he fails to state a claim for malicious prosecution, and the court will grant the motion to dismiss with respect to the claim and dismiss this claim without prejudice until such time as the plaintiff sets aside his conviction. Okay, so it's going back to that, basically saying that until such time as he's proven innocent, he can't bring a claim for um, malicious prosecution. The plaintiff also complains about Assistant Prosecutor Peterson presenting false and misleading evidence to the grand jury. When sued in their personal capacity for damages, prosecutors are shielded by absolute immunity for actions which are intimately associated with the judicial phase of the criminal process. Yeah, so they've got litigation protection. Such activities include activities undertaken while in court, as well as selected out-of-court behaviour intimately associated with the judicial phase of the litigation. Prosecutorial activities protected by absolute, as opposed to qualified immunity, include soliciting false testimony from witnesses in grand jury proceedings and probable cause hearings. All right, because then it's the defense attorney's responsibility to poke holes in it. Even interviews generating evidence to be presented to a grand jury are absolutely protected. Um, citing Rose v. Bartel, Bartel. Prosecutor's solicitation of testimony for use in the grand jury proceedings is encompassed within the preparation of necessary to present a case, and therefore is immunized as, as involving the prosecutor's advocacy functions. Because the prosecutor here engaged in a protected prosecutorial function when he presented the alleged false information to the grand jury, he is immune from the suit to this claim. For this reason, all 1983 damage claims against the assistant prosecutor Peterson arising from the presentation of false evidence to the grand jury are dismissed with prejudice on the basis of prosecutorial immunity. So prosecutors can pretty much say and do whatever they like in the U.S. courts. Interesting. Um, over here, we've got that the paramount duty is to the court, so you can't knowingly lie on the stand or anything like that, irrespective of um, what information you do or don't have. Um, more to the point, even to that, if we, if we notice that our opponents have made a mistake, we're supposed to point it out to a lesser extent as well. Um, not that I'm suggesting the prosecutors lied, I'm just specifying that it's interesting to see that the prosecutorial um, immunity would protect them from such things. Uh, the plaintiff also contends that the UCPO Detective Ho presented false or misleading evidence to the grand jury. The Supreme Court has unanimously held that grand jury witnesses like trial witnesses have absolute immunity from any Section 1983 claim based on the witness testimony. The claim will therefore, the court will therefore dismiss with prejudice the claim against Detective Ho. Yeah, because you can't sue someone for them giving testimony on the stand. It's just It just doesn't work that way. That's one of the fundamental tenets of the court system is that if, plaintiff, if, if witnesses were able to be sued when they got up on the stand for, for monetary relief and damages, then um, who, would who would testify? Who would ever get up on the stand if their interests weren't protected? So... I mean, look, again, it's shithouse and it seems to be hemming in Kai in relation to various things here, but that is unfortunately part of the system and it is there for a reason.
The plaintiff also asserts that Assistant Prosecutor Peterson and Detectives Delacqua, Henderson, Ho, and Vendas, who reported to the Philadelphia Police Department following the plaintiff's arrest, failed to inform the plaintiff of his right to a rape care advocate and a forensic medical examination and failed to activate a sexual assault response team. Now, that's more... That's got more, te more teeth to it. Um, the plaintiff further complains that a sexual assault forensic evidence collection, collection kit and a toxicology analysis were not performed on the plaintiff, but were performed on the deceased. According to the plaintiff, these defendants failed to follow the standards for victims of sexual assault set by the Attorney General of the state of the New Jersey. Yeah, I have some questions about that. I'll be perfectly honest. Um, not treating both potential victims equally, irrespective of whether or not you think one has committed a crime, if there's a chance that the other one is also the victim of crime, you need to be following the same rules and regulations. Because the plaintiff appears to assert that he is entitled to certain protections and benefits provided to sexual assault victims, the court considers whether he states a procedural due process claim. In evaluating a due process claim, the court first determines whether the asserted individual interests are encompassed within the 14th Amendment's protection of life, liberty, and property. Property interests are created and their dimensions are defined by existing rules or understandings that stem from the independent source, such as state law. Rules or understandings that secure certain benefits and support the claims to the entitlement of those benefits. To have a property interest in a benefit, a person clearly must have more than an abstract need or desire for it. He must have more than a unilateral expectation of it. He must instead have a legitimate claim to entitlement of it. Here, the plaintiff has not pled facts showing that he has a legitimate claim of entitlement to a rape care advocate, a sexual assault forensic evidence collection kit, a toxicology analysis, or a report created by a licensed physician or psychologist rather than defendant Padina. As such, he fails to state claim for the violations of his constitutional rights. Okay, that come, again, that comes down to the wording of the documents and the complaint that were filed. Um, so again, I'm unsure whether or not Kai drafted this himself or if he had legal help with it, but that's that comes down to the drafting of the documents and what the court can and can't um, appreciate as an independent adjudicator. So, Yeah. The plaintiff also complains that investigators falsely asserted to the media that the plaintiff had a romp with Galfi. An individual does not have a protected interest in their reputation alone. Instead, defamation is actionable under 42 USC 1983 only if it occurs in the course of or is accompanied by a change or extinguishment of a right or status if guaranteed a status guaranteed by state law or, const or the constitution. Accordingly, a plaintiff must plead a stigma plus claim to his complaint explaining that to make out a due process claim for deprivation of a liberty interest in reputation, a plaintiff must show that a stigma to his reputation plus deprivation of some additional right or interest. Okay, so basically you have to show that the statement that was made caused, a da caused damage to your reputation whilst also um, showing a change or extinguishment of a right or status guaranteed by the state law or the constitution. I mean, look... There are arguments that could be made there. I don't feel comfortable mentioning these online simply because, A, as I've said previously, this isn't my wheelhouse. I'm just reading this because I was um, curious in the case and some people brought it up to me and I thought this was, was well, well worth looking into. Um, but, I mean, I can only really talk from an Australian standpoint and our... I mean, look, that, that would clearly be defamation under our laws, um, but provided he could show a substantive damage and whether or not that substantive, da substantive damage also, say, had an impact on his right to a fair trial, whether or not it would have affected the jury's impression of him, whether or not there was, um, you know, bits and pieces along that sort of line. Um, but, yeah. There, the court stated that a sorry. Here, the plaintiff's claim is foreclosed by the Supreme Court's decision in Paul and Davis. There, the court stated that a claim for defamation by a police department that circulated a flyer imputing criminal behaviour to a person was not a federal claim, even if it were even if, if it would seriously impair that person's future employment opportunities. Okay, so yeah, so it's because it's been raised in the federal court as opposed to the state court again. As such, the plaintiff's fail fail to state a claim for relief as to this claim. 
nor has the plaintiff pled facts showing an equal protection violation based on the fact that he was treated differently from Galfi. I mean, if it was all possible, then yes, there were wor there's wording and whatnot to be included in the documents. Generally, a violation of the equal protection clause may exist when government action discriminates against a suspect class or it interferes with a fundamental right. However, where a plaintiff cannot prove that he is a member of a protected class or that the government has interfered with a fundamental right, he may bring his class his claim under a class of one theory. A claim under this theory is subjected to a rational basis test and the plaintiff must prove he was intentionally treated differently from the others similarly situated. Here, the plaintiff fails to show that he was similarly situated to Galfi, who was the apparent victim of a homicide, and also fails to plead facts showing that the difference in the treatment was intentional dis discrimination. As such, the claim fa fails to state the claim for relief. Yeah, I don't know whether or not there would have been any... Yeah, I, I'm not sure that rises to an equal protection violation, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, mm, I'll, ne I'll need to think on that. Finally, the court will grant the motion to dismiss and dismiss without prejudice all 1983 claims as to defendant Padina. The plaintiff asserts that his defendant is engaged in the unauthorized practice of medicine or psychiatry, failed to follow standards for treating sexual assault victims, and prepared a report about the plaintiff for the UCPO, none of which violates the Constitution. To the extent the plaintiff seeks to assert state law claims for relief against the dependent, defendant or any of the defendants. The court, having dismissed the federal claims, declined supplemental jurisdiction over any state laws for relief. Yeah, okay. Where the claim over the district court has original jurisdiction is dismissed before trial, the district court must decline to decide the dependent state claims unless considerations of judicial economy, convenience, and fairness to the parties provide an affirmative justification for doing so. Leave to amend. In the Third Circuit, the court must also allow leave to amend the ci in civil rights cases regardless of, regardless of whether it has been requested before dismissing a case for failure to state a claim, unless leave to amend would be inequitable or futile. So he, even here, she's saying that if the, if the claims have been amended, there's always a chance that there might have been something there because she's not describing them as futile claims. So the ones where it's been that information hasn't been pled or that there's various bits and pieces... Prior to closing this action, the court will provide the plaintiff with 30 days to submit an amended complaint if he can cure the, def the deficiencies in those federal claims and the court has dismissed without prejudice. For those reasons, as explained in this opinion, the motions to dismiss are granted as to all claims and the moving defendants. The plaintiff is granted leave to amend within 30 days to the extent he can cure the deficiencies in the claim that have been dismissed without prejudice. Appropriate orders followed, dated the 30th of April, 2020. Okay. So there you have it. I think in that instance, um, actually, where do we have, what's it say, see more information? Yeah, see, I can't tell, because um, annoyingly, on it, on our um, court records, so we have a database called Osley, which basically lists pretty much every case from every jurisdiction, but it also specifies um, trigger words, it specifies... Um, the relevant sections of the legislation. It also specifies who acted, who was represented, who had um, interest in the case, all that sort of stuff. Um, so I can't actually tell from this whether or not Kai was actually represented in this or not. Um, but I'm going to have to look and see whether or not he ever actually appealed or reopened this one within the 30 days, because it does sound like there was room to move on that. Um I mean, I presume not, given that this was in 2020 and the other, um, uh, what do you call it, his most recent appeal that was knocked back was in 2021 in relation to his conviction. So presumably that was the end of this particular matter, which is a right shame, honestly, because I think there were arguments to be made there based on what limited information that I have. I mean, it may, may well be that there's a smoking gun that I don't know about or that um, was provided in transcripts for the court and all that sort of thing. So I guess I'm never really going to know, unfortunately. Not, not unless I can um, get copies of the court documents and look into it a little bit deeper. 
Um, close. Alrighty. All right, I'm more than likely going to be doing a part two on this because there are numerous other cases. For example, uh, when McGilvery, again, appearing pro se, filed a suit against Todd Grand, alleging that the defendant had defamed him in a YouTube video resulting in emotional distress, reputational damage, amongst other things. I will go through that one at a later date as well. In addition to that will be... Um, the decision that was made on August 4th, 2021 in the Superior Court of New Jersey Appellate Division, docket number A-4519-18. Which, again, is another 36 pages, so I'm not going to get through that tonight. Um, so I'll have a look. I'll have a quick look, see if there's anything else. I don't think I went through the CBS um, news article. So I'll have a quick look through that as well. I will say that the media source news that is available, I have no idea whether or not it's all, whether or not there's been bits and pieces that have been removed over the years. I mean, look, we are talking a significant amount of time that he was in jail over this, which again, of itself, I think was probably inappropriate, which explains why his most recent application involved an application for habeas corpus as well. Um, but... Uh, where are we? Kai the Hitchhiker sentenced to 57 years. Yep. The man knows Kai the Hitchhiker was sentenced to 57 years in pr prison on Thursday in Union County Superior Court in New Jersey. In April, 30-year-old Caleb Kai McGilvery was found guilty of murder in 2013 for the beating death of a Clark attorney. The body of the 73-year-old Joseph Gelfie was found in his home. The two men reportedly met in Times Square. McGivory gained some online fame in 2013 after intervening in assault. Uh, the jury deliberation was spread over two days for, and a four-week trial. There you go. See? So there's various bits and pieces of the media. So there were, I know that there was one that said that it was they were deliberating for a day after a three-week trial. And all of a sudden in this one, it's two-day deliberation with a four-week trial. So according to the union, this is why we can't trust mainstream media. You always need to read and review on your own and come to your own conclusions. According to Union County prosecutors, Clark Township Police responded to Galfie's home on Starlight Drive to find the victim's partially clothed body prone beside his bed. Investigators said surveillance footage, digital cell phone data, and other forms of evidence were used to identify McGilvery as, the sus as a suspect. Investigators said McGilvery and Galfie first met in New York's Times Square about a day and a half before the victim's death. McGivory claimed self-defense at trial. The county court medical examiner testified that the victim, who stood 5'5", five five, weighed 230 pounds and had a stent in his chest due to a heart condition, sustained numerous serious blunt force injuries to the face, head, neck, chest, and arms, including three skull fractures, four broken ribs, severe contusions, abrasions, and bleeding. I'm not going to lie. Those seem like some severely heavy um, injuries. But playing devil's advocate... I mean, look, no, it doesn't necessarily match up with the information that I have as to what actually happened, but this whole this whole case seems very out of order, shall we say, out of whack. Prosecutors, to the extent of it's also the first that I've that anyone's made mention of him having a stent in his chest as well. Um, prosecutors said the extent of the injuries contradicted McGivory's self-defense claim. They also said that McGivory cut his long hair and fled the state after the murder. Again, bringing up that he cut his hair, I think is irrelevant, honestly. Yes, some people may see it as him attempting to change his, um, change his look, that sort of thing. But at the same time, the simple fact of the matter is that's incredibly circumstantial and doesn't really prove anything. All it does is make an implication, in particular in the eyes of potential jurists. So I don't think it was necessarily appropriate. Um, and I understand that there's actually some debate as to when um, Kai had actually cut his hair and when it was... Um, when that actually took place. So Galfi had been a partner in the railway-based law firm of 
Kashansky, Byron, and Galfi PC, and was a military vet- veteran who reached the rank of major while serving in the U.S. Army from 1965 to 1970. Interesting. Well, I mean, look, as I, as I say on various matters, in particular with what's come up in the recent trial for Amber Heard, you have to do your own investigations. To be perfectly honest, you can't take anything at a grain of salt. Obviously, there was enough there for a jury to be convinced that he was guilty. Do I think it was worth 57 years worth based on the information that I have? Probably not. Do I think that there were mitigating factors? Do I think there was the do I think the allegations against the police and other officials are serious and may need to have actually been investigated? Yes, I do. Do I think that there should have been enough there to have a change of venue? Absolutely. Given the close knit old boys club, basically, of the deceased, his brother, um, various other members of the community, which it does seem like there was a little bit of um, back and forth, shall we say, at least in my opinion, based on what I have at hand. Um, yeah, look, do, do I think that there's case... Uh, I'll be interested to see what happens with the next appeal. Let's put it that way. So, um, but anyway, look, this has been part one of the deep dive into Kai the Hitchhiker. Um, if anyone has any thoughts or comments or questions, anything that you'd like me to look into specifically, please feel free to shoot me an email or send me a DM on Twitter at Glaced Illegal or the email Glaced Illegal uh, at gmail.com. Um, but yeah. Otherwise, join us next time for the conclusion where we go through a couple of the other cases involved so we can get a little bit more information into how a gentleman has wound up with a 57-year sentence for the murder of a 73-year-old man and the circumstances that surrounded it. Until next time, stay healthy, wealthy, and wise, and we'll catch you on the flip side.